another wonderful song service. And uh, I pray that you are open to the preaching of the Word as we look in Revelation chapter 20. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me. Revelation chapter 20. And uh, you're going to need your outline today. It's the insert here. Have that handy with you. I'm going to refer to it twice uh, in the sermon. And let me go ahead and give you the outline here. Number one, well, we're talking about the millennial kingdom. The millennial kingdom. And let, let me start by saying this. You know, I've studied more this week than I've ever studied in one week's time, trying to get the details of everything. And I want to say, I would never in my life preach anything that is against God's word or that, that is not truth. And what I have found out this week, there are theologians, there are Bible scholars, there are people a whole lot smarter than me that have a different camp or a different choice when it comes to the millennium age. And so we are not talking about doctrine here, okay? This, what I preach today, is going to be my opinion on how it's all going to end, okay? So if you have a problem with anything, uh, just call Brother Steve or Brother Cody, <laughs> and uh, they'll straighten you out. <laughs> And I'm joking about that part, but I'm serious about what I'm trying to say. I'm giving you as best I know how, with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and what God's put on my heart, uh, to share with you today. And I will say right off the, bl the bat, okay, I am a <clears throat> premillennialist, okay? And uh, the amillennialism is the second thing group that we will be looking at, and then postmillennialism. Uh, I believe more scripture points to, towards premillennialism. The amillennial, I, I, can, I, can, I, I can accept that, okay? Now, the post one, I've got a problem with, and if we need to talk, I will talk to postmillennialist folks, all right? Because I want to share uh, some scripture with you there. But let me give you a brief, this is not even close to a full definition, but let me give you a brief summary of each one. Uh, premillennialism believes Jesus re will return to earth literally and bodily before the millennium age begins. The rapture of the church begins this belief. Jesus will rule and reign from Jerusalem, okay? And that's just very, very brief. There's much, much more to it. A millennialism, millennialism believes that there will be no literal reign of Christ on earth for a thousand years, the kingdom will be realized by the church on earth and the saints in heaven, and it tends to more spiritualize prophecy, okay? Number three, postmillennialism believes that there will be no literal thousand-year millennium at all. And, and here's where I have a problem with it, and honestly, a big-time problem. The world will just get better and better until the world becomes Christians, and Jesus will reign in a kingdom of peace. And the reason I am a premillennialist is it makes the most sense chronologically. From chapter 19 to chapter 20, I believe it's the one uh, and makes more sense there. Now get your worksheet out or the handout, and I want to I want to give you this real quick. If you'll look at the where the outline is, you'll see uh, the judgment seat of Christ. You'll see the rapture of the church and you'll see the glorious appearing, okay? The first resurrection, and again, this is my opinion, will be the rapture of the church. Uh, and then after the rapture of the church, I believe it'll be the Bema seat for Christians, okay? We will be judged before uh, the tribulation period. And then the seven years of tribulation will happen, and then the glorious appearing of Christ is the second coming of Christ. A lot of people get the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ uh, mixed up, but it's two separate events separated by seven years there, and it'll be the second resurrection. The first resurrection is for the Christians, and the second resurrection, re resurrection is for lost people. Now flip on your backside there, and I, I don't have time to go o all over all of this, but this is explanation in Scripture of the first resurrection, which I believe is life 
for the saved people in the second resurrection, which is death, for the lost people, and we will take off from there. All right, Father, I pray you be with this scripture. Uh, God, I pray that it would cause no division in our church. Uh, God, I pray that you would just help us to seek your face and all that we say and we do. And God, your word is true. It is right. Uh, and God, just be with us in this a sermon today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Number one, Satan is bound. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven. And you have to remember the last thing that happened in verse 19. All right, the beast and the false prophet was captured. All right, and they were thrown into, it, you know, the, the lake of burning with fire. All right, their, their deal is done. All right, all right. And then it says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And, and again, great, you know, uh, some people think it's a huge chain, but folks, you have to understand, uh, Satan is a spirit. It's, it's demons or spirits. You're not going to literally chain them up. All it's saying is God and Jesus has power over Satan. He is the one that decides. He is the one that has the timing of all that. And so uh, he's already taken care of the two, and he is going to take care of Satan himself. And the bottomless pit is the abyss, okay? And it's different than hell. Hell is the, is the last place. That is the final uh, place for those who don't know Jesus Christ as the Lord. And look what it says in great chain in his hand, <clears throat> and he ho held hold, he lay hold of the dragon, that old serpent who is the devil and Satan. And I think it's interesting. I never had noticed this before, but those four descriptions of Satan there and the devil, if you remember back in chapter 19, Jesus was called the faithful and true, the word of God and the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So that goes right in parallel. All right, here's the description of Jesus, and here's a description of Satan. And he is the dragon. Folks, he's fierce. The serpent of old, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The devil, we know our adversary, and Satan is like a roaring lion. We see these, uh, you know, descriptions. And basically what I believe the four things mean is when he gets bound up, he is coming out fighting, all right? He is going to be angry, and he is going to do his best to overthrow God, which, again, will not happen. And bound him for a thousand years. In this, this chapter, the word thousand years is used six times. And one of the things that, that people disagree on, whether it's a little... And folks, when you think of Revelation as a whole, there's literal interpretations and there's symbolic interpretation. And when that goes on, it makes all the difference in the world on where your worldview is, okay? Because it's not always literal. Sometimes it's symbolic. And the average person in the pew, and, and I am in no way, you know, putting you down or saying you don't have discernment. I'm simply saying, uh, you know, it has to be thought through. It has to be under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And we can differ in some ways on these things. And it says, and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him. All right, notice the three things that this angel, and by the way, I believe that angel is Michael. All right, Michael is the strong angel. Michael is God's right-hand man. Michael has been seen before in Revelation. He cast him into the bottomless pit. He shuts the door. All right, he set a seal on him so that he may, should not deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. So we see, we see this going on. Satan is bound. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And again, please don't get, and people make this mistake too, they take the, the part of uh, chapter 20, verse 7 through 10, 
They associate that with the battle of Armageddon, but the battle of Armageddon has already taken place. This is Satan's last stand in those verses. And I'm going to keep trying to point these things out to you as we go. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, I want to give you uh, just a reference on this is not the first time this has happened when it talks about the abyss. Luke 8, 26, then they sailed to the country of Gadarenes, and, which is opposite of Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, there he met a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. Folks, demons are real. They are here today. They will mess with your head. They will lie to you. They will influence you. They will tempt you. It's real. And this person was demon-possessed. A Christian, a true Christian, cannot be demon-possessed. They've already given their heart and their life to Christ. And it says, and he wore no clothes. That'll tell you how crazy this guy is, all right? Nor did he live in a house, but he lived in tombs. Notice this. And when he saw Jesus, he cried, fell down before him with a loud voice. All right, what happens when we fall down before Christ? We worship him, okay? But look, it says, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? He shows total respect for Jesus. Folks, demons believe. They believe. They know who Jesus is. I didn't say they were saved. But they had seen his power. They had seen the miracles. This isn't the first spirit that was thrown out of folks. And look what he says. I beg you, do not torment me. You know what he was afraid of? He was afraid he was going to be thrown into the abyss, which is a holding place for demons. We've seen this early in Revelation where they were held in chapter 6 of Revelation. And then later they were let go and they were part of a judgment. Okay? So they're real, folks. And it says, for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it often seized him and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. So you see how strong he was. You talk about chains, he was chained. And he was so strong. These demons, there were so many of them, they broke that he broke the chains. And Jesus asked him, saying, what is your name? And he said, Legion. Okay, Legion is more than a hundred because demons had entered him and they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. And folks, what he is saying, and it, you remember the rest of the story, it went into the pigs, the pigs went, in the, uh, went into the water and the pigs drowned. Well, the spirits would still be on earth. So that's why he was begging. And, and again, I'm, I'm not you know, trying to figure out why he let some go and he didn't let, and he didn't, you know, he cast some out and he doesn't, all right? But I'm simply saying the abyss is a temporary dwelling place for demons. And that's where he threw Satan. That's where Satan was. He later on, and we'll see in this book, this chapter that we read, that he will be cast into the lake of fire. So we see Satan is bound. Number two, we see Satan's reign. Satan's reign. And again, in the Word of God, Jesus in his speaking many times used this phrase in the New Testament, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. And when you look in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, if you look there, Jesus in the Lord's Prayer says that very same. He says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And I'm quoting <laughs> the King James Version because I've, I've had that. But I'll say this version is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He is talking about a coming kingdom. And I believe he is talking about the thousand year reign. And folks, it's going to be a utopia. It's going to be a recreated earth. It's going to be a perfect place. All right? And, and it's going to be one that, you know, we even see a, a scripture later on that the lion lays uh, down with the lamb, okay? By nature, they would be at an opposite, all right? But not during 
the kingdom of God. And, and I believe this millennial kingdom. So we see Satan is bound. Number two, Satan will reign. And I saw thrones. And we have seen thrones earlier. We saw uh, earlier in Revelation where there were 12 apostles that had thrones and 12 tribes that had thrones. And they sat on them. And judgment was committed to them, which means they were reigning with Christ. We think of the 12 apostles, and obviously Judas wasn't one of them. They went ahead and they picked another disciple. And there's even an argument, which, you know, I, I haven't had time to just study it, but some uh, replaced the 12th disciple with the apostle Paul. And, and there is some possibility of that. But even the 12 tribes of Israel, we know Old Testament and what all that stands for. It says, then I saw souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. So we saw these souls in Revelation chapter 6 under the altar, and they were praying. And they were praying vengeance, okay? They were just saying, God, when are you going to take care of this? All right, we died for the cause of Christ. And, and again, it wasn't a gripe thing. It was just they were praying this. And folks, the fulfillment of this is about to take place because this is the time. This is who they are talking about. They're talking about that souls who have died during the tribulation period. And it said, and for the word of God, who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received his mark in their foreheads or in their hands. They died for the cause of Christ. They said, I'm not taking the mark of the beast. I am not following the Antichrist. I am not bowing to him. All right? And it says, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. And that's why I say these are two separate things, the Christian resurrection where the Bema seat is, and, and this is a different one. This one here at the very end will be the lost uh, judgment, uh, which is the great white throne judgment, which, by the way, in two weeks, uh, we will be looking at that. And it says, this is the first resurrection, and the word blessed, this is the fifth beatitude in Revelation. Blessed and holy is he who has no part in the first uh, resurrection over such uh, the second death has no power, okay? Christians, we are blessed. We are made holy. And there is no power over death. Folks, we do not have to fear death. Doesn't matter what comes up. All these things are coming up. And by the way, uh, <laughs> I've had more than one person say to me in the last month, tomorrow, Jesus could come. The eclipse starts the rapture. And I, it took every, well, let me think. I need, <laughs> let me just say, let me calm down first. In my opinion, tomorrow's not the day. And if it is, I will apologize to you in heaven. All right. <laughs> but I don't think it's the day. All right. They're, they're grabbing straws with the scriptures I heard. And let me give you my opinion, and this is just an opinion, and I'm not saying because I am not picking a date, but there is a good chance it's going to be this fall. There's a good chance. And that's, I, I'm still studying that, but there is a date coming up that could possibly be that. And I'm still not going to name a date. I'm just saying it could be this fall. Why do you think, folks, Jesus tells us many times to be ready. You better be ready tomorrow, is my advice to you. Not, and it may happen. You better be ready, is all I have to say. Because when this stuff starts happening, folks, it's done. It's done. It's too late. Okay, when you get to the judgment seat, you're going to be at one or the other, and you're not changing your mind. You had every, every, it's just like the millennium. Why the millennium? Because there are people that say, says, why is that even necessary? I'll tell you why, because people are going to be born. They're going to be li li live longer. And again, there's still going to be choices. Those people that live during that time, they're just not automatic Christians. 
So what he's doing in the millennium, in my opinion, is giving a chance for even more people who that possibly have went through the tribulation time, give them a chance to be saved. Is that not like God? Isn't it like God? I don't have time to turn there. One day to the Lord is like 2,000 2, years. Okay? So he's only been gone two days, according to 2 Peter 3, 9. All right? So think about it. All right? I'm just asking you to think about it. Over such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God. And folks, we are priests. We are a royal priesthood, okay? And again, you know, I, I'm not knocking anything a priest does from other denominations, but I'm simply saying Jesus Christ is in us. We have access to the Word. We are God's spokesperson here on heaven, here for heaven. And the priest of God and of Christ shall reign with him a thousand years. So it will be a millennium time. It'll be a time where the, the earth as we know it is recreated. Uh, a lot of the stuff, you know, it'll be just in some ways the Garden of Eden before Adam and Eve messed things up. Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65. Go with me there. Isaiah 65. Well, I got it marked. I just can't find it. There we go. For behold, I create new heavens and new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever for what I create. For behold, I create a Jerusalem as a rejoicing. This is the new Jerusalem where Jesus himself will reign. And it says, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and my joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no longer be heard, nor the voice of crying. No more shall an infant from, uh, from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. Which basically is saying they're going to live longer there. They're still, you still have to decide. All right, saved or lost. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build another in, 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 uh, inhabit. They shall not plant another and eat. For the days of a tree shall be like the days of my people, and my elect shall long and enjoy the work of their hands. Because there are folks who think all we're going to do is sit around and, uh, you know, with the angels and they're strumming harps and we're just going to sing, sing, sing. All right? There's purpose in what we are doing. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth their children to trouble, for they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord and their offsprings with them. And it shall come uh, to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion uh, uh, shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food, and they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. So we see Satan is bound. We see saints will reign, and then Satan is defeated. Folks, I'm telling you, he is already a defeated foe. But here is Basically, I want to call his last stand, okay? Verse 7, now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison, that's the abyss, and will go out to deceive the nations who are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. There will still be many people, many people, and they went, upon the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saint and the beloved city, which is talking about Jerusalem. And fire came down, uh, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Much like the battle of Armageddon, that same thing is going to happen. There won't be a sword lifted. I am telling you, uh, God and Jesus will take care of that. And the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are 
and they will be tormented, tormented day and night forever and ever. Folks, these people that do not think hell is real, they need to read Luke chapter 16, and they need to read this verse in the Bible. Hell is real, and it's set apart. It wasn't made for humans, okay? The demons and Satan. But what I'm saying is, everybody has a choice. Are you going to choose Jesus? Are you going to choose Jesus? Because you can see here, uh, it is real. That's where the devil and he, you know, the Antichrist and the false prophets, they will be there. The demons uh, that have been running around uh, you know, crazy and doing all these things uh, that, that are going on even in the book of Revelation, they will all be cast into hell. And uh, we're running out of time here. I, uh, if you get a chance, Ezekiel 39, 1 through 10, it talks about uh, Gog, you know, Gog's, army, Gog's armies and all that's going on there. Uh, most likely, uh, Gog could be a leader of uh, Satan's crew, uh, but he ha will have these followers like he always does, and uh, they will be defeated. But I want to give you one more verse that's not on, and this is the practicality of all this. Okay, Second Thessalonians 1. Go with me. Second Thessalonians 1. Second Thessalonians 1, verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all bounds towards each other. We need to grow. Us. He's talking about the church. All right, we need to grow in the faith and the knowledge of Jesus Christ so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecution and tribulations that you endure. Folks, I'm telling you, it's coming. If the Lord tarries, it's coming. We will face persecution. There are things already going on. All right, and I am telling you, it is from the pits of hell. You just, you look at the way the world is. You look at all, and, and there's, this, there's this part of people, uh, just, they, they just do things. That, you know, they know it's wrong, yet they do it anyway. All right? And man, all these things are going on. Folks, it's truly the signs of the end time. And we as Christians, I believe the longer God tarries, the more intense the persecutions will be, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. So he's used the word persecutions, tribulations, and suffering. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angel in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That separation is going to get wider and wider. We are going to be hated before it's all said and done. They're going to be on us. All right, you may lose your job because you won't do a certain thing. You may lose different things, folks. I'm telling you, it is coming. Verse 9, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in, uh, in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because of our testimony among you was believed. What do we do? We just keep doing what we're doing, folks. We keep coming to church. We keep inviting people to church. We keep trying to win people to Christ. All right? It's going to get harder. It's going to cost you more, but it'll tell how deep your faith is. Now, here's the part I wanted you to hear. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with his power. Folks, we have something the world doesn't have. We have the Holy Spirit power inside of us. We have you know, uh, you know, God in human flesh was Jesus, and Jesus is in our hearts. 
And we have that power as Christians that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, I know it's coming. I believe with all my heart the rapture of the church is the next thing on God's prophetic calendar. And we need to just keep doing what we are doing. Not in fear, not with hate, all right? We are to glorify God. We are to encourage the brethren. We need to defend the faith in love. And we need to show the glory of God in our everyday lives. Father, thank you. Thank you for just your word. And God, I thank you for the study and revelation. God, I know it's hard sometimes it really is hard. Uh, and, and God, I, I'm so glad that you've got things in control. Lord, I do believe that if we're saved, we have nothing to fear. We don't have to fear death. We don't have to fear imprisonment. We don't have to fear anything. Because God, you're going to take care of us. And just like the martyred saints, God, you're going to give them, and you have, I believe with all my heart, given them a special place. And God, I'm just saying, and, and I mean this with all my heart, it would be an honor to die for your cause. So God, Paul knows what he's talking about. The disciples knew what they were talking about. Several of them died for the cause of Christ. So God, I pray that our faith would be so strong that we would not fear, we would not doubt, that we would stand firm in our beliefs and in our faith. God, you know how this thing's going to end. You really do. And God, I just pray that we will be ready for it. Be ready for it. God, I pray that we would invite people to church and that we would share the gospel with people around us. And God, that we would be some of the most positive people here on earth. Why? Because we have hope. We have hope far beyond the grave, Lord. Your word is truth. It is life. It is living. And God, I thank you for that truth. And God, I thank you that we are going to go to a place called heaven. When all is said and done, we are going to spend an eternity with you. So God, we love you. We praise you. And God, if there's one here that doesn't know you, God, I pray today would be their day of salvation. God, I pray that they would just surrender everything to you. God, I pray... Uh, for rededications, Lord, that we would be living a life looking forward to the return of Jesus Christ. Those here that need to follow the Lord in baptism or even join the church, God, I pray that you would just, through the Holy Spirit, impress that on him. God, this is your church. This invitation is your time. So God, thank you for the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?